So tonight I have planned to get the front of the bike disassembled. I'm gonna take the forks off and I wanna take the steering head apart and check the bearings, but I wanna put new fluid in the forks as well. So that's it, that's what I got going. Winter Projects 2021. So I have a bunch of homemade tools. This one takes the front axle off. It's, it's a nut with a bolt welded to it. So we drop the wheel first, then we loosen the brakes get the brakes out of the way so the wheel comes out. Remove the reflector with a 10 millimeter. It's actually part of the support for the fender. Some people remove these, I've left them on. All right, this clip, by the way, has a squeeze head. So from underneath, you could squeeze this instead of prying it out like a madman like I just did. And on this side, I could have taken this off before. It's just a little clamp. It's proper fitted on, so we've got to squeeze this out of here. And now we remove the fender. Careful, don't scratch anything. Oh yeah. Now we loosen the bolts from the triple tree. These are six millimeter Allens. Now the top bolt. So this is the first time I've ever done this. I didn't know if that was spring-loaded or what, but it's not. It's a nice little cartridge. So I backed off the spring, I can reset it, but look how this pulls out. Once you've unthreaded it enough, it comes out. Now I don't have to take it out. All I gotta do is invert it to pour the fluid out. All right, after draining the tube fully, I didn't see any more coming out. And I tilt it in all different directions. I also was pumping it up and down slowly. You'll find more fluid comes out when you do that. So this is a motorcycle specific 
uh, measuring cup for fluids, you know, like fork oil and stuff. Hang on, I think my wife's coming. Hang on. Okay, she's gone. So anyway, as I was saying, this is motorcycle specific Pyrex, you know, typical specific for the shop. And I will be using today the Maxima fork fluid. This is the uh, um, five weight, 85 to 150 anti-stiction racing formula. By the way, this has basically the same viscosity as the OEM fluid, which is why I'm using it. All right, I'm back in the man cave. I got a delivery. I got my new socket set Allen wrenches, a garage specific milliliter measuring cup. And also I bought my wife a new Pyrex to put in the kitchen to replace the one I violated. So here I am back in the man cave. I'm doing a little cleanup right now. So this is version number two or revised or alt ending. Um, when I put the fluid in my forks, I dumped in the full capacity. What I skipped was the instructions in the manual that said, don't do that. <laughs> the manual said, now that you've done that, you have to measure the height of the fluid in the tube to a specific spec. So alternatively, what people do is drain the fluid out of their fork tubes thoroughly. And I saw some videos online. There is a complete process that people do this. I'm very thankful for their wisdom and their experience. But they thoroughly excavate the cartridge of all of its fluid, then measure, then replace that amount and put it back in. That's the cheap and quick way to do it, rather than taking apart the entire cartridge. I looked in the manual. There's a lot of specialty tools for that. I don't want to take apart my cartridge if I don't have to. So what I'm going to do is follow the... Um, the wisdom of others online who have gone before me and I'm going to replace the fluid. Uh, my buddy James um, said, hey, just take the 520 back out, measure 520 back out, then drain the rest of it and you'll know how much to put back in. And that was that stinking genius because I really don't want to take apart this cartridge. There were two people on YouTube that hollered at me and said, dude, you're doing it all wrong when they saw my initial video, which I took down because I don't want anybody else doing it wrong. So thank you to Jay Cartagena and Garcia Family Adventures for giving me the heads up on what I did wrong and how I filled these forks incorrectly. Uh, like I said before, this is the first time I've done this. Uh, and I, like you, I rely on YouTube. I rely on the internet. I look for uh, other DIYers who are sharing their knowledge. And uh, this is the community of YouTube. And um, while I'm good with tools, a lot of what I'm doing here is new to me. So, thank you guys. Yep, 120. All right. So I've pumped these things up and down a number of times now and more fluid just keeps coming out. And when you pump them all the way to the bottom, you can hear it gurgling. So you know there's more fluid inside. So I keep doing it and then moving the tube up and down and then the fluid comes out. I'm gonna process that until it's empty and then I'll refill them. Here's something I've learned. Uh, one, I posted a note on New England Writers Group and a man named Bob Rivet, Bob Rivet, don't know how to say his last name. Anyways, he said, uh, bushings, check your bushings, that little bit of metal you see in the oils from bushings. It's like, okay, no problem. I went online, I searched, I dug. Even when you find the diagram, every part's there except for the bushing. The picture's there, but there's no part number, no arrow, nothing. So some other forums I saw said, don't touch it, don't go near it, you can't find them. Okay, so I'm gonna leave it alone. I'm gonna just put the fluid back in, I'm not gonna disassemble the cartridge. And by the way, it made me think, if I can't replace the bushing, which is a wear part, if it wears, I'm gonna have to replace the entire cartridge. And I've seen the entire cartridge assembly for about 895 bucks. Ow, 
because I don't believe if you just buy the inner tube that that comes with the bushing on it. The diagram shows that's separate. So you'd have to buy the entire assembly. So if this isn't justification for annual fork oil changes, I don't know what is. Next winter, I'll be back here doing this again. Hopefully it'll be a lot faster because I have learned quite a bit during this process. So the forks have been sitting there draining and dripping and stuff just keeps coming out of them day after day. Not a lot, but some more comes out. So what, almost a week they've been like this and there's still fluid coming out. Not much, it's down to like nothing. So just to back up a little bit here, I've been trying to figure out how many milliliters should I put in my fork tubes. So I filled a thousand milliliters roughly into my fork tubes without completely draining them of the old fluid. So the question is, after I substantially, truly drain the fork tubes of all of the fluid inside, and that's by doing it the cheap way without taking the cartridge apart, how much do I put back in? So ultimately, I came to the conclusion from measuring 505 milliliters is the amount to put back in. Now that made me feel good because that's how much I measured coming out because when I did some homework online, I found other people were finding 510 milliliters was a perfectly empty tube amount to put back in. So I feel good with 505. I'm gonna start with 505 milliliters in each tube and then we'll go from there. So uh, like dirt bikes and such, when they're too stiff, they take 10 milliliters out. When they're too soft, they add 10 milliliters. So these tiny increments make a huge difference in how much fork fluid you have in that fork and in the ride quality. So I feel good confirming online that someone else was in that ballpark. I'm gonna do 505, assuming 510 is probably right, but I didn't take everything apart. So if there's five milliliters left in there, let's just assume there's a little padding there. But if the forks are too soft, I'll add a tiny little bit later. If they're too stiff, I will suction some out later. But right now, I'm gonna go with 505 in each fork tube, seal them up, and call it done. By the way, this is mine. If you do yours, empty those tubes thoroughly and find out how much is in there before you top it back off. Oh, and just an FYI, one of my forks was a little like stiff feeling compared to the other one. But once I fully drained it, wow, it felt better. It felt way better. After I got all the old fluid out, they moved so much smoother and better. So I'm happy to be putting fresh, clean stuff in. I'm happy that I got all the metal shaving old decayed fluid out. Again, it was four years and about almost 20,000 miles on one fill, the OEM fluid. This probably should be done every year. This is my fork tube holder otherwise known as a Dodge Caravan floor mat. A little bit of dirt. Clean rag, wiping everything out. Don't wanna put any impurities back in. We just cleaned all that out. So this canister is 500 milliliters. We're gonna start there. And then I'll use the shot glass to top it off with five more. Brand new fork fluid. 500. Oh, I can hear the air bubbles escaping. Hear those air bubbles? All right, now, shot glass. Top it off with five more. Oop, that's it. All right, that's right at the top. I'm gonna move it slow if I can. Make sure all the air bubbles are out. There was one. That was a big one. Still getting some air bubbles.
Ooh, that's smooth. I think that's pretty good. I'm just gonna bolt it up, call it good, and do the next one. I don't see any more air bubbles. And again, I'm gonna torque this tight once I put it on the bike. All right, believe it or not, it's like a day and a half later. <laughs> so we're just gonna repeat the process on this side, just a day and a half later. Then the five. Fiber. Ah, like a little cocktail. Air bubbles. 505. Done and done. Just like the other one, moving it around a little bit, making sure the air bubbles are all out. Oh man, that is so much smoother. I'm so surprised. What happened is as soon as I got, and I might have said this already, but as soon as I got all of the fluid out, these things got crazy smooth. And now with the fresh fluid in it, it's even better. So I'm looking forward to spring, testing it out. Again, if I need to top it off, I will. I feel good about that. They look good, they feel really good. And I think I'm really close on the level that I'm supposed to be at with the fluid. All right, gently guide, making sure I got my cables in the right spot. I don't want to have to redo. All oh, right, look at that. And then right at the tip, when they were installed, it was just perfectly flush on the top with that aluminum. So I'm just gonna leave it as such. I'm gonna put a little tension on the bolt just to hold it in place, but I'm not tightening anything down yet, just to hold it. Now I'm gonna do the other side. No scratchy. How pretty is that, huh? All right, now I'm just gonna install the front pieces of the bike. Some really pretty caps. They did a good job with these. All right, tightening them down. Now I'm gonna put a little tension on these bars to hold them in place, but I'm not gonna torque them down all the way because I might want to adjust them forward or backward uh, once I sit on the bike. Nice and even, aluminum, you can crack. You do not want to side load one more than the other. If you can see, what I'd like to do is make sure that the gap here and here is the same. As you're lowering this down, it should be even. You shouldn't have one side touching and this side gapped out. They should be even and you should uh, lower them down or tighten them down evenly. Now this guy. So it looks like the cables go on the inside and then your little nubs just go right up in here. Such a simple design. I was, you know, when I started working on Japanese made vehicles, my first one was a Mazda um, Miata. I was so impressed by some of the simple design engineering that they had. Cost effective and yet highly effective. <laughs> Here she goes. And I'm not doing a specific torque setting, I'm just doing them taut, not tight. It doesn't need to be that tight. About there. There. About there. There. So if you remember, I had a strip bolt on this pinch clamp down here in the bottom of the fork. So I beat it up and was able to get it out with a bolt extractor. However, the old Allens were ruined. So I found some locally and funny to find the exact same length. I think it was 35 millimeter. It was impossible, but these are 40 millimeters. So they stick out of the back five millimeters, a little longer. Now, the reason that's a problem is because here's what I've learned. That's a dirty area, it picks up dirt. So if these threads get filled with dirt and you go to take them out, you could strip the aluminum base on your fork. That's bad. So in conversations with some guys on Facebook, on New England Riders, these guys have been riding for a long time. They've been working on bikes for a long time. So I value their feedback. They said anti-seize might not be the best thing to use down here because they were worried it might loosen up. Now I've read online and of course the anti-seize people say, no, there's metal in here that doesn't allow it to back off. However, in some very buzzy situations, I read people did report loosening, 
but I couldn't find anyone to report loosening in this kind of a thing. But here's something beyond the lubricant or it loosening up. One, it affects the tightening torque because it's a lubricant. It makes it slide a little different. The manual doesn't call for it, and I'm just trying to keep it from seizing and doing what it did last time. These are stainless steel, that's aluminum, two different kinds of metal. Anti-seize works really well. However, they suggested thread locker blue or thread locker, a light thread locker. This is a very medium strength thread locker. It'll actually come loose if you put some torque on it. Now the reason thread locker is interesting is because it acts like wax and it seals out dirt and water and impurities, whereas this may attract sand and dirt which could actually gum up the threads even more. And I think I realized that's what happened last time. They were filled with dirt and that's what caused them to freeze. Again, same bolts here and these were fine. Down at the bottom, filled with dirt and they weren't fine. So I think I'm gonna put a little bit of this on them. All right, I just did some homework online. The thread locker uh, blue is perfect and I have some of that. It actually works well with stainless steel and it's designed for things that have to be removed frequently and it locks out moisture and it locks out dirt. So it dries nice and it repels the ugly and it'll keep these threads clean, hopefully, so I can remove them more easily. So I'm gonna use blue. All right, so the threads and the thread holes are nice and clean and they're ready for thread locker. But let me get my axle and I'll start putting together this front wheel first. Now this axle's gotten a little ugly, so I'm gonna clean it up first. I'm gonna use my favorite metal cleaning device, fine steel wool. I'm gonna inspect the wheel. The seals look really good. I'm just cleaning them. And then I'll re-lube. Now I have to order new tires for the bike and this wheel's gonna have to come back off. But for the sake of this project, to finish it up, uh, and I wanna do the brakes, I wanna have solid mounting surfaces for the brakes when I'm torquing on things and wrenching on things. So I'm gonna put the wheel back on. I'll pop it back off when it's time to uh, replace this tire. So before I put the fender back on, I'm gonna clean the bottom. I never get to clean the bottom. <laughs> it's actually not as bad as I thought it would be. Little Armor All Bath. Our spacer. So what's weird, when I first took this wheel off, I thought I lost a spacer. There's only one on this side. And on this side, it's the actual axle that acts as the spacer. So I'm not gonna tighten all this down yet, the front wheel anyway, because I gotta take the front wheel back off soon so I can put new tires on the rims but I wanted this set up this way so I can work on my brakes. I wanna mount them properly uh, so it gives me a place to hold them. I wanna make sure everything aligns. I just wanna put my brakes back in place. Oh, and before I forget, I need to tighten these nuts up, both of them here. All right, we'll let those rest right there. All right, so this bolt needs to go to 23 Newton meters. 23. 20, 23. That is some thin metal. You do not want to over torque this thing. How horrible if you stripped out the top of your fork tube. Mm. All right, the manual says to tighten these first. Why? I don't know, but we'll follow instructions. And I'm gonna do them evenly as well. So about 15 on each, 15, and we'll work it towards 23. There's 20, there's 20, 20, 20, 23, 23, double check, double check, 23. After I ride a bit, I always retorque, 23, 
23. Yeah. 23. Handlebars are not torqued yet. But again, I want to sit on the bike and check it first. I'm leaving these covers off of these to remind myself to adjust and retorque. Hopefully I remember. So here's what I got left. To finish this all up, obviously I got to put the headlight back on, a couple of quick little wire connections uh, and simple couple of bolts. Um, and then also I got to tighten my axle nut to proper spec and I got to put the two pinch bolts back in. And these I'm going to put medium, if you remember, blue Loctite to seal the threads from dirt and grime. That's the plan. And uh, again, thanks to the guys at uh, New England Riders Group who gave me the heads up that that was a good solution for more reason than one. So I'm going to call it a night and I'm going to push this video out. I'm going to be attacking these brakes and I have new brake lines to put in. Pretty ones too. So thanks for watching. God bless you. Thanks for being patient with me. Again, this is the first time I've done a lot of these projects on a street bike. Um, I've never owned anything long enough <laughs> to dig in so deep. So this is great. I love it. I'm having a lot of fun. And again, thanks for watching. Thanks for your feedback, your comments, and thanks for following along. I hope you're learning as I'm learning. If you have any questions, comments, or if I missed anything, give me a shout out. I really appreciate the feedback. Thanks, guys. See ya.